You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com and co-hosts Alex the Viceroy Jacobson from Options Express, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Option Block, everyone's favorite by weekly source for all things options related. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as from the Options Insider Radio Network. If I sound a wee bit different today, it's because I have a lozenge plastered to the back of my throat to try to fend off any more coughing fits. I've got that great seasonal cough, which makes recording and talking all the time so pleasant and so enjoyable. So we'll do what we can to make sure you guys don't have to suffer through that along with me here on the old program. And of course, where can you find all 400 plus archived episodes of the Option Block? Well, of course, the mothership theoptionsinsider.com. Just click on the Insider Radio Network tab as well as just click on the overlay or pop up, click on the show you want, click on the View Archives button there and you can get all 400 plus episodes there of good old OB for your listening pleasure. And of course, you can also find all the other dozen programs on the network or you can surf on over iTunes, Stitcher, AHA Mobile, however you like to consume the program. We don't judge. Just listen. That's all we want you to do. You can listen however you like. Take the RSS feed, put it in whatever podcatcher you like, or if you're too lazy to do that, just don't want to do that. Just grab the mobile app available for iOS, Android, and even the Fire OS. I've tried out the Fire version by myself, actually, on our, some of our new Kindle devices, and it works pretty well. Not a lot of people are really using the Fire OS, and a lot of people are really downloading our Fire version, but it's out there, and it works. So check it out if you have a, a Kindle Fire out there, or one of the few out there who have the Amazon Fire phone, the the dodo bird of technology there, the lost, the lost holy grail. All right, and joining me on the old program today, starting off with the man beaming in from the furthest distance here on the old program, you know him, you love him as the Rock Lobster, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from the pit, as well as his myriad duties on the old Options Insider. You may catch him on some of our other programs every now and then on the old network as well. He's a busy little bee, Mr. Rock Lobster. Maybe that should be your new your new handle on the show, the Busy Bee. How's that sound? The Busy Bee, I think, I don't know if the Busy Bee is going to catch as much as the Rock Lobster has. People are throwing lobster at me all the time like they like. The Busy Bee just... It just sounds way too busy, too buzzy. I don't, I don't know if we can do busy bee. <laughs> but, you know, plus I'm kind of large. So I don't know if a bee really is appropriate. Lobster feels more weighty. You know you've succeeded and, and you've made some impact when I can assign you a random, completely random, nonsensical <laughs> nickname and people will embrace it wholeheartedly. It's always a good thing to see. Uh, yes, my, my, my whole two fans, they pull for me every day, which I appreciate. 
the Rock Lobster fan base. Small, but very, very motivated, and that's why we like them. And also joining us from there in the background doing his best Darth Vader impersonation because he is beaming into us via that most magical of 21st century technologies known otherwise as the telephone. He is the Viceroy himself, Mr. Alex Jacobson from Options Express by Charles Schwab. Mr. Viceroy, welcome to the program. We'll get you any way we can take you, even if it is by some 19th century technology. Thank you, Mark. Very, uh, very kind of you. A lot to talk about today. Big day in the market today. Yeah, a few things actually cooking out there in the old marketplace today. A few things happening that we can get to. But before we get to those, let's get to our last but certainly not least cohort compatriot on the old panel. Uh, you know him. You love him as Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program, sir. Always excited to be here. And special shout out to my wife today. She has been a nurse for about 17 years. And today she just pre- passed her nurse practitioner test. So we have an NP in my family as of today. Wow, serious business. She's wearing the pants. You're just you're just coasting now. I don't have to. I, I can just sit around and trade all day now. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> now you can truly be Mr. Mom the way you've always wanted, sir. There you go. Mr. Mom and snowmobiling. Sounds like a good, good gig. I like it. What more could a man want? <laughs> All right. Speaking of what more could we want, what more could you want, listeners? Well, maybe for us to get going with the show. So it's time to get on rolling with the old trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the trading block. We are recording this on Thursday, January 22nd. For all of you playing the home game, and as Alex alluded to, it was quite the busy day on the old street today with most of the major indices rallying hard, really, really hard into rally mode. I'm looking at my screens now and just pretty much a sea of green across the board. I'm hard pressed to find a red aside from ye old VIX cash. Seems like GM ticked down a little bit, too. That's kind of really about it. Most of the major indices like the S&P up one and a half percent today. Nearly 30 handles uh, to 2062, so fully, fully into rally mode. Uh, The Dow up 1.5% as well, or 250-odd handles to 17,809. The Q's up 1.8% or 1.8 handles to 103.94. And the good old VIX cash, as you might expect uh, with all this rally home mode, taking it on the chin off 2.3 handles or down to about 16.5 right about now. Of course, all of this rally home mode, all of this ebullience in the old marketplace uh, coming on behalf of our friends over the overseas there across the pond uh, saying that they're going to do their own little bit of QE and people have been waiting for this announcement for quite a while kind of a bit of a foregone conclusion but nonetheless maybe the size of it and the immediacy of it people liking it because the market is rallying hard they announced a 60 billion euro which translates to about $69 billion per month program of the ECB uh, to purchase private and public debt of course they're big inflation hawks over there and deflation hawks, I should say. So they're really trying to uh, keep their inflation levels around that 2% target that they have out there. So that's kind of what sparked a lot of the news. Of course, we have some earnings and other things to get to first, but a lot of talk to talk about on the macro level. First, Mr. Alex, since we're talking macro, we'll start with you. ECB making some big moves, market rally, and what really caught your eye today, sir? Yeah, that was that was it out of the box. A a a trillion euro stimulus, and of course the the only irony of that when I spoke to our futures desk, they said at the rate the euro is falling, the stimulus actually goes down every day. But uh, to your point, their own version of quantitative easing, and uh, it, it had a real impact on our market today. But it had, you know, a month ago. Uh, all we talked about was what was uh, how active energy was, and all the paper was moving into energy, either in futures on the oil side or the gas side or the stocks or the drillers. Uh, today it was everything but energy. Today uh, you had the good news out of the ECB out of the box, and it ran everything up. And then we got a, a, a tailwind with starting to get some of the good earnings, and just you know. Every, you know, everything was up today. Te- Tesla's up $10 in two days. Amazon's up $20 in two days, um, you know, depending on, on kind of your, your your starting point. But today it was green across the board. There were only a couple red indicators on my screen. One was F5, which uh, guided lower. 
but uh, a great day. Everything was up, out of the box. Um, starting to see a lot of activity in uh, in foreign exchange, in trading in the euro, uh, obviously trading in the Swiss franc. That began more than a week ago, but lots of volume across the board today. Yeah, you mentioned the, the oil names. Uh, oil taking it on the chin today in light of this news as well as the uh, Department of Energy announcing the largest build on U.S. crude stocks in at least 14 years. Uh, WTI was hovering around the 49 handle earlier this session, then it took it on the chin. After that news came out, down about 3%, settling about 46.31 today. Uh, Brent off to about, uh, looks like about, about half a buck to 48.50 after it did break the 50 handle briefly today as well. So crude still still not finding a bottom here as all this other news breaks. And of course, even though I mentioned that VIX Cash is coming off a wee bit today, we're still seeing a lot of volatility. I always remind you guys on this show, upside moves still count in the volatility book. It's not just downside. I know people think that way, but upside moves still count. In fact, when you're looking at the data for this year, it's been just a crazy year. Uh, this is the longest streak since 2012 so far here in 2015 of days with a 1% or more uh, movement in uh, in the underlying. Of course, yesterday's move was about half a percent today, well over a percent, 1.5 percent. This is the yesterday was a 14. Today will be the 15th straight swing of more than one percent intraday. I mean, it didn't move net one percent yesterday, but intraday it actually got down uh, a lot lower than that. So it had a net 1.3 percent move yesterday. So it's been serious movement here uh, so far in 2015. That's the longest stretch since we saw something similar throughout an 18 day period in the middle of 2012, ending on June 21st, uh, 2012. Actually, they moved an average of nearly <laughs> nearly a 1%, uh, 0.85% each day here in 2015, almost double the daily price of about 0.53 that we saw here in 2014. Of course, 2014 was a relatively calm year from a vol perspective, all things considered, so a bit of a low benchmark to gauge things on, but still uh, interesting stuff. So, so far, pretty much everyone and their mother predicted that this was going to be a less volatile year. And so far, this year is proving everyone wrong, including Goldman, who they're the ones who actually issued this report, I think, in many ways to defend their earlier predictions from Buzz Gregory and others who came out and really beat the drum for 2015 is going to be a year of very, very low volatility, low implied and low realized. And so far, this year is proving them and pretty much everyone else wrong. Speak since we're talking vol, Mr. Andrew, what caught your eye in today's market activity? How about the vol crush? <laughs> that that could do it. That could count as something to catch your eye. Um, we mentioned it a little earlier, like at the beginning of the day, you know, we had like the half a percent rally that I think we went to actually down on the day for a while. Uh, but actually vol kept dropping. It wasn't much, but down on the day, vol down on the day is usually kind of a recipe for rally. And that's what we had with the VIX. Um, into the one percent per day range, uh, dropping basically from the twenty handle to the sixteens, um, and starting to exhibit what I would call like normal contango. Even with these Greek elections, I think, at least from uh, volatility today, nobody cares about. Like, okay, they're going to vote somebody, and they're going to keep doing what they're doing with the Europeans, and eventually, you know, something will happen. There'll probably be some some debt forgiveness, but they're going to make the Greeks because they're just not going to loan them a whole lot more money. And I, I feel like that's kind of part of the deal. Um, and, you know, the ECB is basically going to buy Greek bonds for a while. I, again, all this QE to me has still been a, a puzzler overall. And I, I hope it does not become something that we all have to pay for in a large way down the end of the road. But um, I'm I'm glad that we're not doing it anymore. I would be happier if the Europeans weren't. But for right now, at least, it, the market is taking QE as a volatility killer, which it has been pretty much every time. And it's just a, it remains to be seen how how low it can go, given you know still we've had kind of some swinging moves. I mean, we have one more really event, and then we have our ho hum earnings season, and then then what? You know, there's just so from a, from a vol point of view, I don't think we get down to too much below 16, obviously tomorrow, but we'll see what happens after the Greeks. And then we could possibly see, you know, 
maybe a 15 ball. I mean, we got a lot lower than I thought that we would today. So it was good. I was happy, but um, it's it moved pretty darn fast. That's all I got to say. I like it. Spoken like a diehard Maine libertarian up there in the hinterlands, wanting none of, none of this government interference business. I could see that. But it, you're right. That had a bit of a feel today of kind of like a an earnings event in the market where everyone was waiting and waiting and waiting for the ECB. And once it happened, man, they they, they popped that vol balloon and they popped it hard. Uh, like I said, VIX Cash hovering on the 16 half level. The features even coming in uh, just aggressive, aggressive crushing. They've been waiting until this moment. And now it seems like they just took all the rest off the board for the foreseeable future. Uh, Uncle Mike, in addition to all the other myriad things we've discussed today, what caught your eye in today's market activity, sir? Everything that everyone else has said, but the other thing that's kind of that's catching my eye, not necessarily too much today, a little bit, but uh, the shiny metals. Uh, so far, gold and silver have been on a tear. Uh, in 2015, gold's up around 10%, silver's up around 17%. Uh, not a bad start to the month of January, and whenever people say the word uh, there's gold in Dem Deer, Deer Hills or Ohio Silver. I got to say that I've been doing a lot of smiling lately. So I think that with everything going on, I see a lot of continuation that'll happen within gold and silver. And just in addition to what Alex and Andrew had talked about as well. Well, when Uncle Mike smiles, the market smiles. And certainly that was the case today. And if you need another reason to smile, listeners, well, there are some earnings coming out uh, as we speak after the bell, probably the biggest being good old S Bucks a product I was familiar with quite a bit back in the day. My early days in the IBM pit and SIBO also had Starbucks out there. So one of my first introductions to options products, they're closing today about 82 and three quarters. Uh, that, that 82 half straddle when the weekly has gone out right about a buck 70. So expecting a decent move, but not a heck of a lot. And the market so far, apparently liking what they're seeing coming out of the old S bucks in the after hours, because they're trading about $3 higher right now, 85 in the orders or so. So, that's that's a decent gap. It's about 2x <laughs> what we saw here in, in that at-the-money straddle. So the premium buyers are are happy. Of course, this could be the old problem, too. We talked about many times on the show. You get this nice gap, and before you get a chance to do anything, it, it retreats before the open. So we'll see if this remains uh, par for the course as we watch it going forward here for the rest of the show. Uh, but now it's time for us to keep on rolling right on into our next segment. It's time to kick off the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody, you know that funky tune means it's time. Once again, for the Odd Block, the portion of the show where we break down the weird, the wild, the woolly, the wondrous, the whimsical paper that is lighting up the old options market. Going to kick things off with a name we talk about a lot on the show, but not in this context. Good old WTI, not perhaps the one you may be thinking of. This is the other WTI, the less heralded, the redheaded stepchild, if you will, of WTIs. This is W&T Offshore Inc., ticker symbol, of course, WTI. Uh, closing today, $5.63, pretty much unched on the day. And this is a name, as you might expect, doesn't light it up, doing about 200 contracts a day. But today that changed to the tune of a little over 6,000 contracts going up out here in WTI. Let's call, let's call it WTI2, for, for lack of a better, better term here. And as we've talked about a lot here on the old odd block, the yield hunters are out in force, and they were out in force again today in WTI. What caught our eye out here was essentially a massive block, 6,000. So I mentioned 6,043 contracts went up in this name today. 6,001 of those came in this one, one strike here, this one trade. The April 5 calls went up 6,000 times, like I said, in one block for a buck 25 paper selling. Uh, it went up in the middle of a pretty wide market, but it was a little bit closer to the bid, so it has this leaning towards sale. There's no open interest to speak of here, only 36 contracts. So if this is indeed a buy right as it appears on paper, our friend here is locking in a decent level, certainly better than some of the other buy rights we've highlighted on the show of late. Uh, he's locking in out to April. I'm getting about 15% in return for his efforts. So there are certainly worse trades that we've highlighted out here on the show. I'm sure a lot of people out there in the covered call arena 
would be happy to mark uh, this one in their uh, in their wheelhouse of trades. Mr. Rock Lobster, let's kick things off here today. What do you th- what's your take on our friend here? Getting getting a decent payout here to set up some April buy rights. I, I thought that this was pretty good money for this. You know, all of these all of these um, these drillers are just not looking really good. So and they're at the bottom of the range, but the ball's still high. So you know what? People are like, okay, I'll buy them. I'll sell the stuff at the money. If they actually move, they'll give me a nice return in the meantime. And if not, that's a pretty good cushion. You know, uh, 13%, it's not a bad cushion for the underlying. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, as a like, you know, Tucson has been talking about, I've been doing this myself, except I've just been selling the out of the money puts basically. Um, to take delivery of some of these things and kind of, gird up for the next five years of, uh, um, you know, getting along some of these stocks down here because, you know, we're, we might not, oil might be cheap now, but it probably won't be cheap forever. And I just, if you just continue to try to purchase this names under the market by either selling out of the money puts or these buy rides, I think that's the best way to go. And in the meantime, if nothing happens, it's going to pay the premiums pretty nice. So, what the heck? Yeah, I think a lot of people wouldn't mind being paid 13% to hold a $5 stock until April. <laughs> there are certainly worse <laughs> trades. I, I keep hearkening back in my mind to the guy we, uh, we talked about a couple of weeks ago who rolled from Jan to April for a whopping seven cents. I think it was like a fraction of a fraction of a percent yield. And you got our friend here who's going out to April and getting, getting a lot better. So <laughs> I think people would take that trade over others. So if you're out there hunting yield and you're interested in WTI number two, then perhaps... This is one you may want to pay attention to. All right, moving on to our next victim here in the old odd block. Uh, This is Nielsen Holdings NV, ticker symbol NLSN. Uh, Closing today, $45.13, up about a buck and a quarter, or nearly 3% on the day. And this is the name that does another, another monster of paper, doing about 300 contracts a day. And lighten it up to the tune of about 4x today, about 1,300 contracts. So not the biggest trade, but of course for this name, pretty sizable. And what caught our eye was a little bit different trade uh, than what we saw out there in the realm of our friend earlier, the WTI trade. This is on the put side of the fence. In particular, it was the Feb 45 puts. When we profiled it this morning on the site, we picked up 1,000 of these going up for a buck. 50. It was a little bit weird because we saw stock going up with it. Uh, the stock went up uh, as a, again at 44 and the orders 44 and three quarters. Uh, that is pretty aggressively below the bid, so it kind of makes you wonder if perhaps they were selling puts and selling stock because uh, if they were buying stock, they got a pretty decent fill. Uh, so there were. And it's a little confusing here today too because if you look at the at the monitor yourself listeners you're going to see about three thousand of these going up uh but only only about a thousand or so actually went up a bunch of that other volume later was busted and taken down so only about a thousand or 1200 contracts went up total on this day so it's a bit of a weird one so even though the puts went up closer to the offer probably maybe maybe making you indicate a buy the stock makes it look like it might have been a sell so it's a bit of a confusing one out here across the board from an overall volume perspective and from as to what the hell they were actually doing. It's all opening either way because there's only about 165 contracts open on this strike. Senior Lobster, in addition to rubbing butter all over yourself for your tasty, delicious dinner, what else? Are you, what, what's your thoughts here on good old Nielsen? And, and again, we're lucky that Sebastian was not here <laughs> uh, for the, <laughs> to run with that one. Uh, I, this was, I was a total head sc- I think... This is a, I believe we've got some earnings coming up in Nielsen. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. Like, again, that's why this, this name, uh, the volume kept being taken down because of the, where they wanted to try to get the stock up and uh, you've got earnings on the 12th. So I, I'm going to think it's a put in stock play, but I mean, the, the underlying really never moves on earnings. Um, it, it might have like a, like a $1 range. So I just, in my mind, I'm like, okay, they're just, they're going to sell these puts and sell stock on a ratio and see what happens. Take advantage of the high vol. And I saw the stock just went up to that stock was not taken down that as far as I could see. So 
I guess they're just, you know, they're just going to sell a straddle into, into earnings and whatever happens, happens. Yeah, there's no way they sold those puts on the offer. That'd be a hell of a fill. So they obviously adjusted them on the stock side. Hence that yep. uh, that little bit lower stock price. And there's a lot of ways, listeners, that they will adjust these to get the price that they want, which is why sometimes it looks a little bit screwy on the tape because this guy's not coming out and putting out a block of a 1,000 on the offer to sell. That'd be impressive if that was the case. <laughs> I've yet to see that here in the old odd block. All right, moving on to our final victim, celebutants, whatever you want to call them here, the ones we highlight in the old odd block. Uh, this is KB Home, ticker symbol KBH, not the good old KB Toys. You may be familiar with with your childhood, but the KB Home Builders uh, closing today, $11.87, pretty much unched on the day. This is one of the more robust names we profiled here in the old odd block, averaging about about 7,000 contracts a day, doing nearly 17,000 today. So yet another robust name. What caught our eye here? Flipping back again to the call side of the script in particular, the Feb 12. So just slightly out of the money calls here. Going up for size again. Looks like perhaps the yield hunters out for for out in force here. With when we profiled it this morning, four thousand one hundred and twelve of these Feb twelves going up for forty five cents. Looks like paper selling that went up in one big chunk as the session progressed. We saw a couple of thousand more going up to the tune of nearly seven thousand going up on this one strike sixty eight hundred. And 44. The latter part's coming in for a little bit different prices. All this opening paper, only 866 contracts open on the strike. We've seen some other buy writing activity out here, and uh, this is kind of par for the course. Not perhaps as robust as our last friend. This is about 3%, but again, it's only for one month. So I think most people out there would, would take a, a 3% return for one month of holding uh, KB Homes. It's a little bit near out of the money, so if there is any upside, it's pretty much clipped. That's the return here. That's what he's given up for blasting out all these calls for about 3%. Looks like a vertical also went up out here. Uh, March 12, 13, going up about 2,000 times. That's what accounted for the other 4,000 or so contracts on the day. I'll have to dig into that one to see one up, one up there as well. But Mr. Rock Lobster, take us home here on our friend hunting for yield out here in KB Home. Seems like a bit of a, a recurring narrative these days. I think it is recurring narrative. I saw a lot of that today. You know, you had the rally and you had a pretty strong rally. And, you know, people just, you know what, they, they see the rally, but maybe they don't quite believe it. So they're just going to write calls. KBH is near the bottom of the range. So I, I like this trade as an idea. Um, selling puts in this thing, it's, said it's close to the 52 week low and you know they're saying margins are squeezed and all this other kind of stuff but it, it feels like again selling uh selling puts or a, or a buy right like this it just it, it it's paying pretty decent money and you can kind of set out some of the volatility of the market with some of these names already at the bottom so they're paying you to wait which is what we like here at the old Options Insider Radio Network. Yeah, you know, it's not like you're coming in and loading up and spy at the top and then writing some calls to give yourself some cushion. These names have already been beaten down, in some cases pretty aggressively, and you're getting yield to hold them on top of it. So it's kind of like a double win. I think so. I, I think buy rights seem to work better when the names are at the bottom than at the top. That's just me. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that's a good rule of thumb for all you buy riders out there. Not at the top, but at the bottom. Far, far better for uh, all things all things considered. All right, that's going to do it for the old odd block for this episode. If you want to see more detail on those as well as all the other alerts we didn't have time to get to, of course, surf on over to the mothership, theoptionsinsider.com, or check out some of the other programs on our fine, fine network where we get into a lot of fun unusual activity and maybe mr andrew maybe even make a guest appearance on those programs every now and then no guarantees meanwhile we're going to keep on rolling right on into our next segment it's time for the express block the express block brought to you by options express by charles schwab options express by charles schwab lets you trade where and when you want for every level of trading from advanced charting free daily trading ideas and free educational resources options express by charles schwab is the online broker for all traders best of all options express by charles schwab lets you trade stocks options and futures all in a single account on powerful yet easy use trading platforms including mobile devices visit optionsexpress.com for your free account options express by charles schwab is a member of finra sipc and nfa
All right, everybody, welcome to the Express Block. This is indeed the portion of the program where the Viceroy takes us behind the scenes into the land known as Options Express by Charles Schwab. Alex, a bit of an interesting week on the brokerage front. We talked about last week, of course, that quote-unquote black swan of black swan out there in the currencies in the form of the Swiss franc lifting their cap really wreaked havoc across the retail brokerage landscape. Obviously, a lot of that centered on the FX side of the space. There's FXCM, one of the larger retail FX brokers, taking it on the chin, having to get about a $300 million bailout in order to keep rolling there as a result are increasing their margin requirements for clients across the board, in particular for currencies and some of the some of the metal. CME also, again, adjusting and changing their, their deals in terms of how they relate to FX Vol and other products like that. So we're seeing a lot of shakeups. Uh, I think Deutsche Boris announced some big losses. So a lot of firms have really uh, taken it on the chin as a result of what's been going on out there in, in FX land. I'm sure a lot of listeners are curious as to what's going on over there at OX as it regards and relates to what's been happening in the currency landscape. So enlighten us, please, sir. The floor is yours. Well, there, 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 there are three ways to take that bite out of the currency apple. We were, in fact, an introducing broker to uh, FXCM. So uh, the good news there is they did get a capital injection, and it's all going to work out. The, the reality about the FX market, and, and uh, I think that's an oxymoron to say the reality about the FX market, is – Many of the people who trade in this market, if, if I turn my calendar back to my ISE days, we made a run at FX with FX options. And the, the, the markets are very low volatility with the exception of those occasional, lately a little more frequent, uh, huge events. And I always talk about how Soros took the Bank of England for $4 billion with an FX you know, backspread with moderate risk. Um, the thing about the FX market is, and, and I'll come at it from two sides here. Number one, because it is such a low volatility market, normally it has very, very low margins. And FXCM and a number of firms, when the CFTC a couple of years ago talked about raising the margins for Forex, uh, for the actual direct-to-dealer market, was one of the big advocates of not raising the the margins, and um, uh, this is the opportunity again to remind everybody that margin is not going to save you. Margin is intended to protect your broker from an unsecured debit, and obviously it didn't work here, and there were lots of hits on the street. One of our neighbors up the street uh uh, one of the local Chicago-based brokerage houses took a $120 million hit in FX, but they're very well capitalized. Um, if you're going to trade FX, I would encourage you to trade something like the CME options market. And that way, if you do get one of these large events, if you're on the wrong side of it, uh, you're, you're, you're personally not going to be left with an unsecured debit. Um, and it's, you know, the option you're familiar with. If you're right and you get a big move, you're going to make a lot of money. And uh, if you're incorrect and get a big move, you're only going to lose the premium. But I also want to move to another topic, if I can, quickly. You, you and Andrew talked a lot about these uh, high-yield opportunities in covered rights and put cells. And I'm going to take a fast minute to revisit the covered rights section of the Idea Hub. Now, very quickly, the Idea Hub is an idea generation tool that's here at Options Express, and it is on Schwab Mobile. And you guys showcase the KBH, uh, KB Homes Covered Right. KB Homes Covered Right is the number two idea on the Idea Hub today. And I'm not soliciting a, a specific idea. Don't, don't do any of this until you have a good sense of what the company is and understand the rates of return and what you can make and how much of a cushion you get and what you can lose. But if you're looking for a place to kind of search for these high yield ideas, Idea Hub targets a 7% static rate of return. So I can tell you KB Homes is number two, United Steel 
Steele is number three up there. Uh, but some of these ideas may not be suitable for everyone. But if you want a place to come and look for these things and search for them and then do the, the additional homework before you click on a trade tab, do the additional homework that says, when does this company have earnings? When does it go ex dividend? Is there a news announcement? But Idea Hub every day has 45 high yield covered right ideas on liquid stocks. They have to trade at least a million shares a day. They can only be between a 10 and a 60 vol, uh, but it's a cool place to start. So there you go, listeners. You can front run Andrew and I on the odd block by just surfing on over to optionsexpress.com and check out the the covered call section there, the old of the premium harvesting there in the Idea Hub, because it sounds like they have a lot of them out there already. Who knows? Maybe our friend here perhaps is an OX client, and he he noticed that indicator for himself and decided I'm going to put about seven thousand contracts through <laughs> that nice little loophole out there. But interesting stuff indeed, listeners. Surf on over to optionsexpress.com to learn more and also a lot of you guys have asked us over the years why don't you have an fx option show well some of the fallout over the past few weeks has kind of shown you guys why we haven't set one up yet we like to partner uh, with reputable well capitalized names in the space like an ox schwab like a cme and others and russell and others and there, there are precious few of those in the FX space, as we're seeing witnessed and playing out before our eyes over the past couple of weeks. So, again, maybe we'll get to one of those down the road, but for the foreseeable future, don't see many FX options shows coming our way. But since we're talking about questions anyway, let's keep the dial rolling right on into the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block. This is indeed the portion of the program where you guys take the reins, ask us your questions, your comments, share your insight, give your questions and feedback indeed to your fellow listeners out there. Share some of that insight you guys have gained from listening to this show and all your years of trading and everything else. We love to hear from you. No shortage of ways for you guys to do just that. Include surfing on over to theoptionsinsider.com. Leave us a comment, a question. Use the website feedback form like a lot of our listeners did today. A lot of you guys love to use that, so that's an easy way to do it. Or, of course, hit us up on email, questions at theoptionsinsider.com or via social media, twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider or stock twits. And uh, I'm not sure if it's StockTwits.com or just search for Options Insider on StockTwits because I don't use it enough. I need to check it out more. But we are Options Insider on StockTwits, so you can use that. Or, of course, just download the mobile app available for iOS, Android, and the Fire OS. It's all baked in to there as well. And first off, we have a question from – actually, it's, a, it's an old-time questioner and hasn't been around in a while, but I remember this handle. It's a great handle. This is from Tomabomb. How could you forget a handle like that? And he writes, Fine-headed gentleman. A question for the option block regarding verticals. First of all, you rock. The best show on the network. Well, thank you for that, Tom, and I'm sure all of my other hosts and co-hosts on the other shows are very angry with you. Uh, he goes on to write, and he puts in, thank you, OX. So make note of that, Alex. He's a, he's a fan of OX as well. Uh, he goes on to write, I've been trading high leverage verticals for a while now, and I'm looking for a quick way to price them. I, em I place an emphasis on quick, i.e. without running a model on the individual legs. I've taken, he puts in parentheses here, rightly or wrongly, to using the probability of a finish beyond the short strike multiplied by the width of the spread. He even gives us an example. He puts, for example, XYZ has a 30% chance of finishing above $50 by expiration. I'm long a $45, $50 call spread, so at 30% times $5, I would expect the mid price for that spread to be around $1.50. On balance, this method seems to underprice positive delta and often significantly overprice negative delta. Is this method complete crap? Any suggestions? <laughs> well, I like this question. It's good. It's very detailed. He lays out his thought process uh, in a lot of detail. He even provides an example. So uh, well done, Mr. Tom. I like how he also seems to shoot his own methodology in the foot here a little bit, saying it's, it could be perhaps complete crap. It's an interesting approach. Uh, we hear people talking about a lot of expected values, different trades all the time. It's certainly a viable use case. We said here many times 
on this show that you guys should certainly have an entry point and an exit point in any trade you're setting up, particularly when it comes to spreads. How many of you guys have written in saying, hey, I bought a $5 spread and it went to $3 and then it didn't go all the way to 5 and what should I do? That's a case you should be prepared for when you're trading these. I like to see that you're thinking this way, Tom, because it shows an interesting analytical bent to it. Again, I, I kind of like you indicate here, I'm, I'm not wholly sold uh, on the methodology, particularly when it comes to overpricing your negative deltas. A lot of people out here on the show are, of course, uh, premium sellers or harvesters, to use the, the uh, more euphemistic term. And that may be a bit dangerous to them. Maybe we'll flip the script. Mr. Tusa, I haven't heard from you in a while. What do you think for our friend here with the great handle, Tama Bomb, and his methodology for pricing spreads on the quick, on the cheap, without having to use a model? Well, a couple things. Uh, in terms of percent chances, I'm very leery of that uh, because of the fact that it's based upon a whole variety of the, it, it, your your probabilities and the, the chances of something happening are based on a variety of things. But uh, the bottom line is, is no one can possibly predict the future every time. And so that 30% probability could be completely against you a hundred times in a row and still have a 30% probability depending on which model that you're using. So that's the first thing that I want to say is be very wary of any probability model with which you're using, uh, manage your risk. Uh, second thing on this, the, I, I'm with you, Mark. I really like the way that he's thinking. I think this is very good. Um, I think also that, what would be more important to look at, uh, yes, this is a good model, but how, or yes, it could be a good model, but of that uh, fifty or whatever you're looking to do, at what point do you get out of it should the model not be good? Uh, the way with which I like to set up a trading strategy, and this is an oversimplified example, I take 10 trades, and let's say that I make 10% on six of the 10 trades. And I, I'm not going to uh, add to it. I'm just I'm not going to put more put the winnings into the the other trades. Let's just assume it's ten separate trades. So after six trades, I'm up sixty percent in this strategy. Then in trade number seven, I lose fifty percent. So now I'm only up ten percent on the after trade number seven. And then let's just say that I break even the other two the other uh, three trades. You can look and say consistent ten percent rates of return on trades. But I say don't look at it with rose-colored glasses because you need to look at the whole picture. At what point would this model be wrong? And when this model is wrong, because all models are wrong at some point, unless Longo comes up with one, then how badly is this going to hurt you? So I like the way you're thinking, but I would add to it uh, some of the things with which I just mentioned. That's the one thing I would like to see him add to his question is where he's getting these probabilities. I have a feeling he's perhaps conflating the definition of delta to kind of uh, derive that probability. And we talked about it a little bit on this show, a lot more on Volatility View Show. That's a bit of a of a perversion of what delta is actually supposed to be. A lot of people out there seeing, think of delta as a probability of expiring in the money that actually isn't accurate. If you have a very, very low volatility name, it could kind of be an approximation for a decent probability. And of course, at the money, it's kind of a coin flip. So 50-50, it kind of works there. But when you get into some of these high swinging names, uh, delta really falls by the wayside from a probability. So if you're using delta as your pure probability of predicting that out of the money strike and your chances of going across it, you might be... Uh, might be in for a little bit of disaster uh, going forward. Mr. Andrew, I can hear you chomping all up and down the Skype channel, so I'm sure you have a lot to share with our friend here. Mr. Tomabomb, what do you have to say for our friend here with the explosive handle? <laughs> I just was looking at his method, and he says, uh, on balance, this method seems to underprice the positive delta. Um, well, because positive delta trades, usually that upside call is going to be skewed down. So that spread will look expensive. And uh, for a put spread, because he's saying it overprices the negative delta, because, because of downside skew, a put spread always costs you less money. Uh, when, you buy, when you buy a put spread, it always costs less money. When you buy a call spread, it always seems to cost more money. That's because of skew. So what he's uh, maybe not taking into account with the method is that the market is pricing that that uh, out of the money put stuff at a premium to the out of the money call uh, stuff when you talk about those options and delta. So 
Unfortunately, what his method does is, is you know, the market does not have a flat uh, volatility surface. And unfortunately, with his, what, what he's doing there, it just he's, his, his method, while it kind of sounds like a good idea, um, it's, it's kind of not, it's not taking into account uh, the, the skew of the options. And calls are deliberately underpriced. So when he buys those call spreads, that upside call he's selling, he just doesn't get a lot for the sale. And sometimes they're better off just buying like a regular call. And conversely, a put spread will always trade cheap because of skew. So they make slightly better purchases. Um, and I don't know how that's going to how that affects his methodology, but that's the reason why his method seems to be always overpricing and underpricing stuff because the market builds that in. So Andrew falls on the complete crap side of the fence here. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, it's I think it's a good. I don't know if it's complete crap, but. Um, there's a reason why that the pricing he describes is like how it is. I'm just putting words in your mouth for fun, sir. You're more in the middle, the, the medio, medium crap, mediocre crap. <laughs> just some crap. <laughs> just a wee bit of crap, a be, just wee a wee bit of stench of manure in that in that methodology. Not complete, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Viceroy. Where do you fall here for our friend, Mr. Tom Obama? <laughs> So, um, you know, both Mike and Andrew have given him kind of the, the challenge in the Greeks. I want to give the guy some credit. First of all, he's doing the analytics. Yes, we can all uh, argue about probability. I mean, in theory, you draw probability from the implied volatilities in the option market. And to your point, Mark, if he's drawing it from Delta, it, it, it's off a little bit. But kudos to the guy that he, I, I mean, his premise is, I don't want to model it. I'm trying to create what I'll call a back of the matchbook um, way of pricing these things. And to Andrew's point, volatility is not uniform across, across strikes and expirations. There's going to be some noise in it. But I give the guy an enormous amount of credit for creating a methodology and, and observing what Andrew just explained. And, and this way, when he puts a vertical on, he has this kind of intuitive sense of, you know, is it a decent idea? Um, it, it, is it perfect? Verticals, calendars are truly very hard to to put a probability on because of things like skew and calendars, different time frames. But his concept of taking the out of the money, looking at the probability of that, I, I think from a pure intuitive, I'm, I'm going to write these numbers on a cocktail napkin or the back of a matchbook. I like what he's doing. There you go. A vote of not crap from the Viceroy. A vote of mediocre, medium crap from Andrew. I think Tucson probably falls on the medium crap as well. I probably fall there as well. I, I think Tucson and I have the same question about the probability. But you're right. You're, you are, you are, uh, your, your question certainly denotes a bit of a good, a good approach to the problem, even if the, the underlying methodology was a little bit skewed, a pun intended. If you guys out there want to learn more about what we're talking about here when it comes to Delta. It's pretty dense stuff. Let me warn you, we could easily fill several shows with it. But just search for a paper called Understanding Risk-Adjusted Probabilities in the Black Shoals Model. It's by Lars Teague Nielsen, I believe. Uh, it's some of it's in French, but it's translated, don't worry. And you could, if you want to dive deep into the actual probabilities and what Delta really means, then this is a good way to do it. I think a lot of people have, over the years, have just gotten accustomed to the bastardized. Traders even say it to this day, oh, I'm a 70 Delta, then I'm going to show up at this event. It's just kind of the shorthand for Delta, but it's not a entirely accurate. And this, uh, this paper will break it down for you a little bit. But great question there, Mr. Tomabomb. Great handle. Missed that handle on the mail block. Hope you write in again with more questions. Meanwhile, that's all the time we have for the mail block this episode. Now we're going to keep on rolling right on into Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for... Around the Block. All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block. This is indeed the portion of the show where we talk about what we're keeping an eye on for the rest of this week. Obviously, ECB was kind of the big mover and shaker. That's already out now. The market is digesting it and liking what it saw. <laughs> we also mentioned Starbucks at the top of the show. Here we are now at the bottom of the show, and it's still up 
fairly significantly. It's coming off a little bit. It's not up about three bucks anymore. It's about two fifty or so now, but still a, a decent rally. Certainly a decent premium over what they were trading here at the close on the at the monies there on the weeklies. So interesting to see where that opens up tomorrow, and if you premium buyers out there and S bucks can uh, can capture some of that elaborate elaborate movement. We also do have some more earnings, including uh, after the bell tomorrow on Friday the twenty third. We have good old Mickey D's coming out there. Always are a a bit of a bellwether for the overall economic environment. I've always joked that if a McDonald's can't make money, then, uh, then the economy's doing something wrong. Uh, so we'll see how they are faring tomorrow. Aside from that, perhaps, Mr. Viceroy, we will start with you. What are you watching for the rest of this week into the old weekend? Well, uh, GE also uh, has earnings tomorrow, but uh, I think the interesting thing is going to be next week because next week you've got Microsoft, Apple, and and Amazon, and now that we live in a world of robust weeklies, I, I suspect with those three next week and the ECB's news today, I, I am going to go out on a limb and forecast that weekly volume will be uh, in the record next week. I think we'll see uh, probably two to four of the busiest weekly days uh, with Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft uh, next week. Um, the other thing we're watching is, and today's rally was macro, and every time I say that, I know uh, a lot of people start, you know, putting up the loser sign on on their forehead, but uh, this market was driven by macros. The euro looks like it's going to parity. Uh, I know we talked about that on the show, and God, the tenure is living under two. These are these are interesting times. Yeah, in terms of the earnings cycle coming up next week is hot and heavy. We got Microsoft on the 26th. We got Goog, good old Goog, Amazon, and even Ford on the 29th and splitting the difference there. Facebook on the 28th and a number of other names I probably haven't even listed here. So it should be hot and heavy uh, next week from an overall earnings perspective. And then, of course, somewhere in between there is a little name that Uncle Mike may be interested in. I think it's called Apple. I think it's a French company, and they are announcing on the 27th. So. A lot to keep an eye on. Somehow, Uncle Mike, I'm going to guess that's going to be your around the block for this week is that little company called Apple. Um, well, I, I thought the earnings for Apple weren't for another couple months. Did I say January 27th? I meant April 27th. I'm sorry. Okay. I, yeah, I we always, uh, yeah, because of that one time you messed me up, we still have to clarify to the audience from four years ago how uh, you like to lie about Apple's earnings dates through my sending me emails and <laughs> sending those birdies to my house. Midnight saying, IM messages, you name it. If I can harass you on Apple earnings, I will do so. Yeah, you do plenty of that. Um, yeah, of course, Apple. Going into the earnings announcement, I'm long stock, long put. We got out of a put spread this last week. We've been uh, doing okay with some of the weeklies. It's just been kind of channeling a bit lately. We've been selling put spreads on the dips. Uh, the other thing that I think is going to be the market mover or what could potentially be the market mover coming up is the FOMC uh, coming out next week. Uh, it's one where I, I think that everyone's watching the Fed. Uh, the last time that uh, we had a pretty big rally in this marketplace was in December when we everything was going down and all of a sudden the Fed says everything's uh, we might not raise rates anytime soon. Well, we might possibly raise late rates later. I don't even know what the heck they said. They said something to where the market liked it and the markets went up. Uh, so long as they can keep using this vague language in a good way that the market likes, we could see a rally next week off of the Fed meeting or they might say let's raise rates and we could be go, go down to a thousand on the S&P. My 50% guarantee still stands. <laughs> down to a thousand on the S&P. That would be quite the day. <laughs> <laughs> that would be impressive. Yeah, it seems like with the Swiss franc and now with the ECB coming out, it seems like most of the most of the weapons are out of the Fed's quiver, but you never know. Uh, they could have something up their sleeve that no one is really expecting. We shall see next week. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Rock Lobster, what are you paying attention to for the rest of this week into the old weekend and perhaps even next week? Really just like you got the Greek elections. I see the FOMC that Mike is saying. Um and, you know, the earnings have been kind of, I guess, so-so. Some good, some bad. We haven't really had a uh, – I haven't got any earnings statistics piled up, mostly just anecdotally. Um, kind of the banks are doing bad. Obviously, the oil companies, some of that low oil prices are starting to show up. And the home builders haven't been great. So I think earnings overall have not been great, although we haven't really seen any of our tech bellwethers yet. You know, we haven't seen the Googles, Apples – 
Um, Intel, the earnings were good. They actually had real revenue growth, but they, as usual with Intel, they go, well, we made money. We made gobs of money, but uh, it, it looks next year looks tough. <laughs> kind of always say that. Um, so at least from that point of view, uh, you know, Netflix was up, I don't know, 90 bucks or something like that over the last couple of days. So I, I, the only really bright spot so far that I can tell has been uh, tech. Um, kind of the other, the other industries have been sort of sideways, uh, a little good, a little bad. So I think, you know, as far as earnings growth, we're not seeing anything great and tech could only really be the bright spot, I think. Um, but like, and again, Mike said, there is some, there could be some macro stuff up everybody's sleeve, but all I know is the U S is out of QE. The deficit keeps going down and all those things long-term are positive as long as we don't screw it up too much. And the Europeans don't get themselves into a pickle again. So that's where we are. They love those pickles over there in Europe. All right, good stuff, everybody. And, of course, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show. And, of course, we're sending in such great questions. Keep them coming. We love to hear from you guys. And on behalf of the Rock Lobster and the Viceroy and Uncle Mike and, indeed, myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience. And, of course, if you haven't done so already, surf on over to OptionsExpress.com. Kick the tires, light the fires, as they say. Check out those tools Alex was alluding to. You may even be able to get in on some of these big yield plays before Andrew and I talk about it on the show. You know, by the time we talk about it, usually those guys have, have taken all the yield for themselves. So if you want to beat them to the punch, surf on over to OptionsExpress.com. Check out the Idea Hub for yourself. And we'll see you next time right here on the Option Block. The Option Block was brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.